us this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior. such an honor to serve you and to worship you lord i pray that this morning as we worship you that our worship be pleasing to you and the word that we hear this morning in this place will be from you and that we take your word and we take it out into this world that you give us boldness to do so and the words to speak in jesus name amen Day is brighter here with you. The night is lighter than it's you. Would you be me to believe? Which leads me to believe. You make everything glorious. You make everything. 
we do want to be a people in a place that worships our Father. And, uh, but we also want to be a place where people love on one another. So do that right now. Turn around and greet each other. Question was raised as my conscience fell, a silly little lie. It didn't mean much, but it lingers still in the corners of my mind. Still, you call me to walk on the edge of this world, to spread my dreams and fly. But the future's so far, my heart is so frail Think I'd rather stay inside But you love me anyway It's like nothing in life I've ever known Yes, you love me anyway Oh Lord, how you love me how you love me It's upon my strength to simply be still Seek but never find All the reasons we change the reasons I doubt and Why do loved ones have to die But you love me anyway Nothing in life I've ever known Yes, you love me anyway Oh, Lord, how you love me I am the throne in your crown But you love me anyway I am the sweat from your brow you love me anyway. I am the nail in your wrist, but you love me anyway. I am Judas's kiss, but you love me anyway. See now I am the man who yelled out from the crowd. Your blood to be spilled on this unshaken ground. You said I turned away with a smile on my face, with this sin in my heart. Tried to bury your grace, and alone in the night, I still called out for you. So shame of my life, my life, my life. But you love me anyway Oh God, how you love me But you love me anyway It's like nothing in life I've ever known Yes, you love me anyway Oh Lord, how you love me Yes, you love me. 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 Now you love me. Thank you so much, Caleb. Just appreciates Caleb's uh, passion for worship and his, his, his gift and, and all that he does to, to, uh, to honor God uh, through music. We're just so much blessed by that each week. We, uh, last week, uh, we returned to the book of Acts and uh, looked at uh, the, the, uh, a man by the name of Felix, uh, a governor. 
of uh, the, the area of Judea. And, and I indicated that we're going to look at kind of three of uh, government officials that, that Paul would run into over the, the next three weeks. And so this week we're going to look at the next, uh, the next guy, and that is a guy by the name of Festus. And, uh, and, and Festus, uh, a little different than Felix, Felix, um, the procrastinator, this week we're going to look at, at Fest, Festus, the pragmatist, and, and, and so we're going to look at, the, through the lens of pragmatism in the church and the danger that that, that represents. Felix, the procrastinator, he's replaced by Festus, the pragmatist. And so when we look at it on the, on the outside, it looks like Festus is a, a lot better governor. And I think he probably is. He, he comes across in the brief encounter we have with him, but there's somebody that wants to get things done, that, that, that's going to clean things up that are left over from, uh, from the work of, of, of Felix or the uncompleted work. And so if procrastination says, um, uh, I'm going to do this tomorrow, uh, the pragmatism says, what do I need to do to get this done today? And so from, from our perspective, that's a good thing. In fact, we would view pragmatists as a, a positive thing in our, our culture. We, we, we value pragmatic people that, that would look at a problem and, and try to find a solution to that problem. They're, they're results oriented. They're looking for, how do I fix this? What, what do I need to do to make this work, to get the right results? And, and so we, we value that in our, our businesses and, and, and our jobs. That, that's a good thing. I value that in, in our leadership team. And people that are pragmatic in the sense that, that they're not dogmatic and this is the way we got to do things, but, but there's a, an approach of how do we find a solution here? What, how can we accomplish this? But we're going to see that there, there's a danger in the church with pragmatism, that, that we have to be very careful. We can be pragmatic, but we don't want to be pragmatists in the sense that that governs and drives everything that, that we do. The pragmatic approach is to say, what do I need to do to get this accomplished? And pragmatism holds that an action is good if it achieves the desired outcome. So it's a good thing if it gets us where we want to be. And, and so that, that, could, that could lead us to, 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 to do a lot of different things. We could, we could try different things in order to get to the end, but maybe in doing that, we might be doing things that we really shouldn't be doing just because it leads us to the, the, the outcome that we want. And so we're going to look today at the dangers of pragmatism in the church. I think this thinking has had a proud, profound effect on the church. And, and it has led us to do things maybe that we would never really consider, but, but there's, a, there's an end result we want. There's a goal we want to get to. And so in order to do that, we're, we're able to and willing to maybe bend things, to do some things that we wouldn't normally do because it gets us to where we want to be. It gets us to the result that we want to have. And that introduces some uh, dangerous thoughts in, into the church. And so oftentimes in the church, we ask the question, what works? And, and that drives us to decisions and, and programs uh, that, that maybe aren't honoring of God, aren't, aren't consistent with what God would want, or maybe even are, aren't consistent with Scripture. If what are, motivates us is, is an end result, and, and instead of seeking uh, a ministry, a pragmatic ministry is, is about doing certain things, not about being a, a certain kind of people. It's about doing things, ministry in a certain way. And so we're going to look at, at the, through uh, Festus's life and his pragmatic approach to dealing with Paul and, and how that correlates to some ministry mistakes that we can make when it comes to pragmatism. So that's going to be what we look at today in, in Acts chapter 25. And uh, before we begin that this morning, let's, let's pray together. Father, uh, I thank you just for uh, the opportunity just to worship together this morning. Thank you for the fellowship and uh, the blessing it is to be here together. Thank you, God, just for all that you do, uh, all that you have done, Lord to bring together this body of believers. And we pray, God, that you would strengthen us, enable us, equip us uh, to be sent. 
and, and to do the ministry you've given us. Today, as we look at the danger of the pragmatism in the church, God, help us to, to see that, that, that you have a way uh, that, that, that we are to walk and that we should never venture away from that, Lord, in order to, to, to achieve an outcome that we think would be best. God, we want to be faithful to you. We want to be faithful to your word. And so use this time to just demonstrate that to us today. Just uh, open our hearts and minds to the great truth of your scripture, Lord, and challenge and change us through that. We thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, in Acts chapter 25, if you remember after, uh, as we ended last week, uh, Felix had uh, left this whole Paul thing to Festus. The, the man who was following him in his position. Felix had been recalled in, in the sense that he wasn't doing a good job. And, and he'd been recalled to Rome. Now, he probably, his life was probably spared because he had some connections. But, but, but he kind of lost his job. And now this guy comes in named Festus. And, and we're going to see, I think, as you read the text, that he seems like he's a little bit more on the ball. A little bit better equipped to, to handle the job of, of being governor of, of, of Judea. Uh, and so uh, as, we, as we begin in verse 1, it says this, Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the men, man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending, the, after spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day, he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. So Paul, it seems like, or, or Festus, as he takes control of, of his responsibilities as a governor, seems like this is a guy that's going to get things done. And so he wants to, he doesn't want to put off until tomorrow. He wants to take care of it today. He's going he's gonna to handle this in an in a, in a, in a orderly fashion. In fact, he seems like there's a sense of fairness in, in, in the description of him. And he's going to, to, to resolve this issue that's been, been going on for some time now. And so he just got in, into town. He's the, there's a new sheriff in town. And now he is going to, to take care of things that have been kind of left from uh, his predecessor. Verse 7 says, When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I've done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? I want you to notice here that, that Festus is looking for a middle ground. And this is the, the heart of pragmatism, is finding a, a compromise, finding something in the middle. Because right away, he's trying to, he says, do a favor. He's trying to appeal to the, the, the Jewish leaders by saying, Look, how about if we, how about if we bring him in? We'll do this, we'll bring him to Jerusalem. And we can do the trial there. That'll, that'll kind of be a, 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 a kind of a little token uh, bone to the, uh, to the Jewish leaders. And so he thinks he can find a middle ground with them. Verse, uh, verse 10 says, Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. And so Paul says, no, I'm not going to agree to that. I have a, I'm a Roman citizen. I have the rights not to go and be, be confronted by the Jewish <clears throat> religious leaders. I have a right to be confronted, to, to have a court of conducted in a, in a Roman court. And so it really kind of an interesting thing. If you remember a month or two ago when we were studying Paul and Paul was headed to, to Jerusalem and, and everyone was saying what? Don't go to Jerusalem. Do not go to Jerusalem. It, 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 is, it is disaster waiting for you. And Paul wouldn't listen. He, he continued on believing that God was leading him to Jerusalem. Now, now he's been arrested and he's on his way to Rome, essentially. And, and people are saying, let's go back to Jerusalem. And Paul's like, I'm not going to Jerusalem. As, as, as convinced that he was, that he was to return to Jerusalem. Now he's convinced 
that God is sending him to Rome, that he is not to go back to Jerusalem. And so Paul digs in and says, no, I will have nothing to do with that. And the fact that he's a Roman citizen gives him the right to, to demand that from, from Festus. And so verse, um, verse 12, uh, after Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. After a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. Now, really interesting, the perspective of Festus, isn't it? Remember Felix? Felix, he knew all about Jesus. He knew the details, the history of the person Christ. Now, Festus obviously is very, this is a very impersonal, just what he knows about their belief system. He says it's about a dead man named Jesus who supposedly came back to life. He, he's learning about Christ, obviously, in, in, this, in this trial. He doesn't know much about him. And so his, his, his approach is, is very uh, removed from, from the uh, the, the Jewish customs and the Jewish religious traditions. Verse 20, I was a loss how to investigate such matters. I think that's really funny. There's a, there's a dead guy who supposedly came back to life. I don't even know where to begin how to investigate that. That's what he says. I think that's kind of funny, kind of, kind of, kind of cool. I wouldn't know either. But, 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 but for, for his trial, for, for Paul, and, and this is what really the, the heart of what they're fighting about is whether or not Jesus came back to life or not. And he's like, I don't even know where to begin to conduct an investigation regarding that. Verse uh, 20, I was at a loss on how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these emperor's uh, or on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself, he replied. Tomorrow you will hear him. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city at the command of Festus. Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought before all of you, brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. And so Festus was a, a pragmatist, and he, he came to town. He immediately wanted to clean up what Felix had left. And, and there seems to be this sense of fairness, uh, a, an understanding of, of, of the judicial system and, and what it's intended to bring about. And so he, he, he immediately begins, and, and it seems like he believes that he's going to get things kind of fixed pretty quickly. He's going to get things kind of cleaned up because he is a pragmatist. He is results-oriented. And so what we see is that the first thing that we need that is evident in this whole description from, from uh, on Festus is that pragmatism focuses on results instead of the truth. In fact, throughout this, throughout this little dissertation with Festus, Festus indicates on several occasions that he kind of already knows the truth. He, he indicates that the evidence doesn't support what the Jewish leaders are saying. And, and yet, he continues on with this because there's a, there's a result he's working towards. 
He's not working towards truth. He's working towards an end result that he desires to, to, to have. He wants to appease people. He, he wants a, a, a equitable, good finish to this that's going to look good for him, and it's going to make people happy. And so he really isn't that concerned with truth as much as he is with the end result. Pragmatism focuses on that. In fact, truth becomes dependent, becomes the end result. Truth is governed by the result. Whatever we end up with, that's the truth. And, and that is what, what drives uh, Festus in this. And so Festus, as he works through this, because that he is looking for an end result, because he has already determined what he wants at the end, it's going to govern the way he acts. And the first thing we see, and we see this in verse 9, is that he's going to be swayed by public by, by opinion, by public opinion, by what the people think. It, it's influencing him. Verse 9 indicates that he wanted to do them a favor. He wants, to, he wants to give them a bone. He wants to help them out a little bit. And so pragmatism will almost always lead to populism in the church. Now, what does that mean? Populism means we are governed by the opinion of people, that we're going to make decisions based on what the opinion is, the general consensus of the crowd. And, and, and that can be very dangerous. We're, we're a, a congregational-led church means that the church votes on things. But, but realize this, that, that the vision of the church, the, 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 uh, the, the decisions regarding the ministry of the church come from the, the heart and, and, and of, of those who lead, the elders, the pastor, develop the vision of the church and cast that vision for the church. And, and it is not that we vote on all of that. It's not that, that opinion guides all the decisions that we make. We don't do that. And when, when you fall into populism, then you're swayed back and forth with whoever happens to be in positions of power and influence at the moment. And so populism can be very dangerous in the church, just as it is even in our culture and in our government can be a very dangerous thing. And so populist means that what determines the direction of the church or your, your life as a disciple is what are most of the people saying? What are the people around you saying? What are they thinking? What are they guiding you to do? And, and so... God is not interested in a, a consensus. That's not what God's looking for in the church. He doesn't want a consensus. He wants, he wants the truth. He wants commitment. He wants godly followers led by the Spirit of God to do whatever it is God has put on our hearts and not just a, a majority vote. And so what we see in this is that, that, that Festus has within him the ability and the authority to fix this. And when I say fix this, I mean make the decision. He has all the evidence before him. He knows the truth and he can, he has the, he can make the decision. He's indicated the evidence isn't there. There's no evidence for what they're saying. And in fact, he even says when they, when they, when they brought these charges up, it wasn't even what I was expecting. It's like this is, this is, is, is ridiculous really is what he, he is saying when he looks at their charges and what they want to do as a result of those accusations. And that is take his life. And so, as a result of this, Festus refuses to exercise the authority that's been given to him. He could have simply let Paul go, but because he, he has the ability to make that determination. But, but in verse 12, he says, After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. You see what happens? He could have decided this. He, he had the ability, but, but pragmatically, he doesn't want to do that because of the result. And so what he does is he passes the buck. He is not going to do what he has been enabled, authorized, given the, the ability to do. He's going to move that on. And he says, you want to go to Caesar? To Caesar you will go. And I, and I, 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 I notice I, or I read in that uh, an, an element of, of kind of anger of, of uh, you're, okay, you're going to get what you want then. And so he is going to, to pass him on to Caesar when he himself could have taken care of this, could have made the decision. Pragmatism uh, follows the path of least resistance. 
He, he, he could have made the decision, but he didn't because it was easier. The path of least resistance. Pragmatism runs up against the opposition and finds a way around it. It, it finds a compromise. It, it finds a, a, a means of, of working through the, 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 the ugliness of the situation. Now, we like that when we're in a, a, in a, in a, a, a counseling session. When, when we have two people that disagree, we like the pragmatic approach that helps us to find a middle ground, a consensus. But, but sometimes in the church, that can't be. That, that there's a truth that has to be first and foremost. And so pragmatism will follow the path of least, least resistance. And, and what it will do, it will lead us to believe that when we run up against a difficult circumstance, that means that we're out of God's will. With pragmatism, when you run up against opposition, your assumption is that I must be out of God's will, and so I need to find another way. And so for, for, for Festus, send him, to, send him to Caesar. Move him on to Caesar. Because if I make that decision, people are going to get angry. I'm going to have a real mess. There's a result I'm aiming for. It's peace. And peace will come when I move this man out of my responsibilities into somebody else's. And so he refuses to deal with it. And so in the church, when we operate that way, we begin to think that every time things aren't going the way we think they should go, that, well, we must be out of God's will and we need to adjust things. We need to make things more palatable. We, may, we need to make it more acceptable for people. And that's what Festus attempts to do. And so he does what works best for him. In verse 18, it, it tells us in, in, in verse 18, when his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. And so he's indicating that, that he, he was believing that, uh, or what he heard them say was like, that is not what I was thinking. This, this, is, this is not the charges that I was expecting to hear. He was obviously thinking this is going to be much uglier, much worse charges than what they turned out to be. And so he he uh, does what's best for him. It seems that he already knows the truth. Truth, he indicates there's no evidence to support what they brought against him, but he refused to follow that evidence. And so, in the same way, pragmatism leads us away from the truth. Pragmatism leads us away from the truth of Scripture. And I want to give an illustration of that to help you maybe best understand it. And if we look at this verse, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, a verse that many of you probably are familiar with, but it says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. What does that say? It says it's the gospel that saves. He says this, it says, it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone. It is the gospel that saves. We know that to be true because that's what scripture says. Now, when we look around our churches today, we look around our own church, we want, we want people saved, right? We all would agree on that. We want people saved. And so there's a result we're aiming for. It's salvation for people. And so we know from Scripture that that happens through the gospel. But we know from personal experience that there's some other things maybe that we can do that could at least get us to the point where it looks like we have salvation. The trouble comes in this. How do you measure that? And so here's what happens. We begin to work not towards truly presenting the gospel so that people can be saved. We begin to work to get what we think is getting people saved. And so we work towards getting people to raise their hands. We work towards people getting people to pray a prayer. We, we, the goal becomes not salvation. It becomes getting somebody to an altar. It becomes what we think is salvation as opposed to the gospel. And listen... There, those, there's nothing wrong with those things, but if that becomes the goal, if that becomes the end result, we can walk away from the only way that people are going to be saved, and that is the gospel. And so, I, I, you know, I say this because I've, I've been guilty of this, and I look back at my life in youth ministry, and I, sometimes I kind of shudder to thought of this, but, but I can stand up before a, a group of you, and I can make a very emotional appeal that, that'll bring tears to your eyes. And might even motivate you to come to the altar or raise your hand or pray a prayer. And yet, 
It is not my emotional appeal that gets people saved. It's the gospel that saves people. And so it is so easy for us to pragmatically aim for a different means of getting people saved, and we don't even realize it. Because we, we have walked away from the gospel, and we've begun to use other things, other techniques, other ways of getting people to what we believe is salvation, but in, in fact might not be the case. It doesn't say that it is praying a prayer that gets you saved. It, it's the gospel that saves. And so it is why it is so easy to, in the church, to, to venture away from the truth of Scripture into other areas, pragmatically, because of the result that it gets. And so Tracy and I have traveled to, to Peru. Actually, our, our first year, maybe even a better example, is the first year we went on the mission field, we went to Costa Rica. And we had people just coming forward in droves in the streets of, 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 of uh Los Chiles and, and San Jose and the, the, the cities and in, in, in barrios in, in Costa Rica. And, and so we were so pumped about that, so excited. So many people were coming forward to know Christ. We got back to Texas and we did this kind of debriefing with the other teams that came back. There was a team that came back from England, from Great Britain. And, and if I recall, there were, we were like, we were talking, we had like a thousand people got saved. And they were like, we had three. They had like three. They had three to six, something like that. And we're looking at, at that as what? Well, we were more successful, right? Because did, did people get saved? I don't know. I pray to God that was the case. All I know is we got people forward. We got people that, that came forward when we had an invitation. I don't know. It's the gospel that saves. It's not getting people to come forward. And so when we begin to pragmatically look for a result, that's what we can do. We can walk away from the scripture. It's the gospel that saves. And we can begin to use techniques and, and, and gimmicks in order to get people what we would call saved when in truth they might not be saved. And, and so when we pragmatically approach evangelism, it can lead us to abandon the power of the gospel and to embrace gimmicks and, and, and tricks and emotion. And in truth, we're not really, people aren't really being saved. Now, please, I'm not saying that people don't get saved in mass evangelistic events. All I'm saying is, what are we measuring? What is, are we, are, are we truly just presenting the truth of the gospel? Or do we have an end result that we're aiming for that we believe indicates someone who's come to know Christ? Pragmatic, being pragmatism in the church can lead us in that direction. Pragmatism minimizes the authority of Scripture because we find another way to get there. If God says in Scripture, this is the way you get there, and we find that there is a way that we can get more people there, then we will kind of walk around that and we'll go to our technique. We'll go to our, our, our gimmick that we use to get people what we believe is saved. And so for pragmatic Festus uh, in this, seeing is, is believing. And, and so not seeing is not believing. So he says, he, he says that, you know, they're arguing over this man, Jesus, who supposedly rose from the dead. He said, I don't know how to investigate that. I don't even know where to begin that investigation. You know, do I call uh, Jerusalem CSI? I have no idea where to begin with this. He, he couldn't even fathom. He refused to consider that's we, what he could not see with his own eyes. And that pragmatism prevents us from seeing that. Pragmatism causes us to, to, to miss that which is not evidence before us. Pragmatism negates the possibility of the supernatural. And so Festus couldn't even consider. It wasn't even plausible to him that someone who was dead was now alive. And so he refused to consider that. Festus, even though he recognized that there was no evidence that Paul had done anything wrong, well, he, he sends him to Rome anyway. Why did he do that? Because of the people. Because that's what the people wanted. And pragmatism leads us to that. It will lead us to government by public opinion. 
We will, as a church, move with what everybody wants. As opposed to being led by the Spirit of God, being, being directed by, by God himself, by, governed by the Scriptures, we will be swayed and moved by the, the public. And not simply the public that is you, the church, even the public outside. We see that in the church today as churches drop you know, doctrinal truths because the culture has changed. Because there's pressure from outside the church to, to change in regards to new things in our culture. And so we, instead of standing on the truth of Scripture, we, we give in to the public. We're moved by the public opinion and, and, and pragmatism will always do that. It chooses public opinion over principle. Do we have principles as a church? And what do you mean by that? Are there absolute bedrock truths that I won't change? That this is a principle. I stand on this principle. Pragmatism order or, or doesn't recognize principle. You can't have principle in pragmatism. Because you're, you're moving towards an agreement. You're moving towards a consensus. You're moving towards compromise. And so I can't stand on things that I believe are absolutely true because I might have to give that up in order to find that place in the middle where we can meet. And so it, it chooses what everybody thinks over a basic fundamental principle. And so Festus has chosen the path that he has. And this is what is at the bottom of all of this, is that because this is what works best for him. At, at the end of this, what works best for him is what he chooses. Now, it doesn't seem that as you work through it, but that's the truth. It's if I don't give in to the Jewish people, then I'm going to be in trouble with the Jewish people. If, if, I, if I don't give Paul a trial as a Roman citizen, I'm going to be in trouble with the Roman government. And so, and so he's finding his way through this. He's moving his way through this pragmatically in a way that is going to be less problematic for himself. That's what is at the, end, at the bottom of this. That's what is it at the, when you dig it to the end, when you get to the foundation, that's what pragmatism is. It's what, what works best for me. What, what brings me to the result that I need to get to. And that's what Festus does. And that's what happens with pragmatism. It will fuel self-centeredness in the church. It causes us to be all about us. And we might work towards giving a little bit to, to try to get what we want, but ultimately that's it, to get what we want. If you've ever been in negotiations, whether it's in a, a, in a, uh, a, a, with your employer, uh, you know, some kind of union contract kind of thing, it's, it's like, I'm gonna, this is what I want, but I'm willing to give that to get here because that would be good enough, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for the moon and I'll be happy with the stars. And, and so it's all about me. It's getting what I want. And Festus, at the heart of this, that's what he's aimed for. And that's what happens in the church. When we fall into pragmatic thinking and pragmatic ministry, we, we eventually, that's what we're working towards, our own wants. It's not what the Bible says. It's not a, a doctrinal, principle truth. It, it is this, this kind of watered-down version of that that I can be happy with, that's good enough for me. And that is the church today. That is the church in the world today, watered down, in, in living in such apathy towards God, in, in such a lukewarm faith that it is useless. And that is a result of, of pragmatism. Now, don't get me wrong. Pragmatic, being pragmatic in your life, in your marriage, in your family, there's, there's, there's some good in that. But when we begin to live that way as a body of believers, we will eventually walk away from the truth of Scripture. We will begin, we will begin following the, the path of least resistance. We will end up at, at a place that a majority of the churches are in the world today, and that is useless, pointless. We need to stand on absolute truth of Scripture that's what is first and foremost as, as a church, as a body of believers. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this example from Scripture of the dangers of pragmatism in the church. Help us, Lord, as a church 
to never venture away from, to never give in when it comes to the absolute bedrock principles of Christianity. That we will never compromise on Scripture. We will never give in on those things, Lord, that are, are maybe uncomfortable to stand on. Lord, if, if you have stated clearly, then we will stand firmly and strongly on those truths. We thank you for that. Help us, Lord, as we enter this election uh, to look for people, not pragmatic leaders, not, not pragmatists, but people who are principled, people who, who love God and are willing to, uh, to stand on that truth and, and, and fight for that truth no matter how difficult it might be. We just pray now as we close this time, God, that uh, you would just work in our lives, work in our hearts, and, and send us out of here today more solidly, firmly planted on the principal truths of Scripture. And we just thank you and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? here as I was concluding the message I was thinking about uh, a, a quote and Winston Churchill uh, said this he said no compromise with the main purpose no peace till victory no pact with unrepentant wrong that is a anti-pragmatist right there that is that is somebody who was con convinced that that I'm not going to give in uh, on these things that are bedrockly bedrock and importantly true and 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 so uh, in in the church that is absolutely the truth also, and so on your on your bulletin and uh, on the screen this morning, a, a quote from Tim Suttle that says this: Church leadership should not be about pragmatism; it should be about faithfulness. Boy, that's it. That's what we need to do: just faithfully uh, go and do whatever it is that God has given us to do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you just for a time together today. Thank you for your word. I pray God your best and your greatest blessing on each of your people as we go from here 
in, in your power and in your love. We thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.